Good morning. Let us listen now to our call to worship. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. O Christians, haste your mission high fulfilling to tell the world that God is one who cares that god who made all nations is not willing one life should perish lost in deep despair publish glad tidings tidings of peace tidings of jesus redemption and release let us join together in prayer. Your steadfast love to us is our joy, righteous God. We gather to rejoice in your salvation, to sing praises to you for all your healing gifts to us. You have called us to faith and have given us strength to live out that faith. You have joined us together in the life of Christ. Hear our prayers and our praise in Christ's name. We now join together to pray the words your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Older Testament reading for this day is taken from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Let us listen to God's word as he speaks to us this day. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Our second reading, our epistle reading, is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-11. through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, 
unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Our gospel reading for today is taken from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon said, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Here end our readings for this day. May God add his blessing to these readings of his holy word. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have revealed to us time and time again that your steadfast love endures forever. We understand this to mean that your spirit touches ours in those times and places where we are most susceptible to being loved and in those times when we are least in control. Thank you for never giving up on us, even though we often think we can give up on you. Grace-filled God, you fill our lives to overflowing with one with wonderful gifts of promise and hope. We are blessed and stewarded and in such abundance that when our eyes are opened, we are amazed and overwhelmed. The responsibility of such stewarding leaves us in awe, not only of the gifts, but of our own implied worth. We have seen ourselves as unworthy, but you turn us around by affirming our worth with your abundance bestowed upon us. Searching God, you call us to share good news and our abundance with others. We understand that we are to share with them an attitude of service and an offering of self that will leave them as amazed at the giftedness of their lives as we are and will bring them to their knees in praise and thanksgiving. You humble us, God, before your goodness and your mercy in ways that change who we are and how we will be in the world. We celebrate in this season of Epiphany that you have appeared to our ancestors and now have appeared also to us. In the name of Jesus, amen. my 
spirit clear my sight holy spirit joy divine glad and now is heart of mine in the desert ways I seen spring of living water spring one Saturday night a pastor was was working late at the church when he finished he decided to call his wife to let her know that he was on the way. It was about 10 o'clock p.m., but his wife didn't answer the phone, even though the pastor let it ring many times. He thought it was odd that she didn't answer, so he decided to wrap up a few things and then try again in a few minutes. When he tried again, she answered right away. He asked her why she hadn't answered before. She replied that the phone had it rung at their house, so they brushed it off as a fluke. The following Monday, the pastor received a call at the church office on the very same phone that he used Saturday night. The man on the phone wanted to know why he had called him on Saturday night. But the pastor couldn't figure out what the man was talking about. The man said, it rang and rang, but I didn't answer. Then the pastor remembered the mishap, and he apologized for disturbing him. He explained that he'd intended to call his wife. The man said, that's okay, but let me tell you something. You see, on Saturday night, I was planning to commit suicide, but before I did, I prayed a final prayer. God, if you're there and you don't want me to do this, please give me a sign now. That's right when my phone started to ring. I looked at the caller ID and it said Almighty God. I was too afraid to answer. But I knew God didn't want me to die. And guess what the name of the pastor's church was? It was the Almighty God Tabernacle. That's why the caller ID said Almighty God. The pastor was just trying to call his wife. The man thought God called. Our Old Testament reading for today is about someone else who is getting a call. And guess what? This time, it's not a pastor calling. It's God, the Lord God Almighty. And God's calling a young man named Isaiah. Let's listen in on what God has to say to him and to us. Let us pray. Dear God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today we're given a look at how a great prophet got into the prophet business, and he feels unworthy, and the presence of the powerful and almighty God, he feels downright inadequate. He doesn't feel up to the task. He thinks that a big mistake has definitely been made. At first Isaiah thinks he must be having a strange dream. Surely he's imagining all of this. What he experiences is absolutely incredible. It's something truly extraordinary, something breathtaking something that fills him with awe, and it changes his life forever. Finally, it hits him right between his eyes. 
This is no dream. And it's not just something he's imagining. It strikes him that what he's experiencing is none other than an encounter with God. It's a visitation straight from God. And naturally, it jars him to the core of his being. In just a few short verses, Isaiah sets the stage for us. He gives us some important details. He lets us know where this vision takes place. It takes place in church. Isaiah is worshiping in the temple. We're told that it's his custom to worship. He takes his faith very seriously. Isaiah seems to be telling us that it is in worship that our eyes get sharpened so that we can spot God at work in the world. It's in worship that we can learn to look for God, how to see God in burning bushes. And he lets us know when exactly this vision takes place. He says it happens in the year that King Uzziah died. It's when an earthly king dies that Isaiah has a vision of the heavenly king, a vision of the true king, as it turns out, Uzziah is the last king to rule over an independent and prosperous Judah. For in just a few short verse, for in just a few years, a parade of empires will rise up to gobble them up. One after the other will hold what we call the Holy Land in its clutches. First Assyria next Babylon, then Persia, Greece, Rome. Tough times lie ahead. They'll endure one oppressor after another, right up until Jesus arrives on the scene. Now this Uzziah was 16 years old when he took the throne. He went on to reign in Jerusalem for 52 years. Under his leadership, the nation rose to incredible heights of political, financial, and military power. By and large, the people flourished. Scripture says that as, that as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. However, there is an important lesson to be learned from Uzziah. His death is an ominous warning to the nation. Greatness without godliness opens the gateway to sorrowful and a tragic future. So what happened to Uzziah? The scripture explains it clearly. He was marvelously helped till he became strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. It seems that he had known success for so long that his heart became prideful. He reached a place where he assumed he couldn't do anything wrong in God's sight. And you can't say that he wasn't warned. We're told that 80 priests of the Lord went in to Uzziah and they warned him, what you are doing isn't right. God doesn't want it this way. Yet as these men spoke God's truth to him, he became furious with them. His pride had gotten the best of him. A king who used to seek the Lord in humility but back to the story. Shortly after the death of King Uzziah, and while he's at worship, Isaiah gets this vision. And in this vision, all heaven breaks loose. It seems surreal. It seems too spectacular to be real. Too awesome to be true. He must be hallucinating. Surely he's dreaming. 
But it soon becomes evident that it's not just some dream. The first thing that Isaiah notices is God sitting on a throne, looking all high and lofty. The hem of God's robe is so long that it fills the temple. Then Isaiah notices the angels above and around God. One of those angels begins to chant, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So you see, Isaiah finds himself smack dab in the midst of a heavenly worship service. God is being praised. God is being thanked. And God is indeed present right in their very midst. They're all having a marvelous time, and evidently the service gets pretty loud. We're told that the corners of the building begin to shake, and then the entire house fills with smoke. Isaiah is stunned, amazed, filled with awe. He can't help but feel small and unworthy. This moves him to honestly confess, right there in front of God and everybody, Woe is me! I am not worthy! I don't belong here! For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet miracle of miracles, my eyes see the real King, the very Lord of hosts. That's when one of the angels flies right over to Isaiah. He holds a live coal from the altar and a pair of tongs. He touches Isaiah's mouth with it. And just like that, he's branded, forgiven, and made whole. And then he hears these unbelievable words. Fear not. Now your guilt is removed from you, and your sin is blotted out. Now you are equipped. Now you are worthy. Now you have what it takes. That's when Isaiah hears the voice of God in conversation with someone. As clear as day, he hears these very words. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And did you notice? Isaiah doesn't wait to be asked. He doesn't even know what the job is. Doesn't stop to ask what he'll be required to do and to say. Even where he'll be required to go. He just blurts out these unforgettable words. Here am I, send me. He responds, Here am I, send me. For some reason, Isaiah no longer feels afraid. For some reason, Isaiah is moved to do God's bidding, to be God's spokesperson, for better or for worse. Dwight Moody was one of the greatest preachers and evangelists of the 19th century. I bring him up because it relates directly to our text for today. It seems that he wrote some words next to Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 in his Bible. Remember that's where it says the very words that I just quoted to you. I quote them to you again. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Next to that verse, Dwight Moody penned these words in his Bible. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. 
Like the great prophet Isaiah, we are also gathered for worship, and we are reminded that as disciples of Christ, we are also called. True, our calls may not be as spectacular as his, but we are called nonetheless, called each day to follow Christ, called to share his precious gifts with others, forgiveness, peace, hope, love, joy. So each day may we be found saying, here am I, send me. And may we be guided by Moody's words, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. And we can do this with great confidence. That's because God doesn't just send us out on our own to sink or to swim. God's Spirit lovingly and faithfully goes with us every single day, every step of the way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Beyond my highest joys, I prize your people's ways. The sweet communion, solemn vows, the hymns of love and praise. Our Lord invites to his table all who love him, and who desire to live in peace with one another. On the night when he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup which was poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins is the new covenant in my blood. So drink from it, all of you. God, we thank you that once again we're invited to join you at your table. To join you as something truly extraordinary happens. To join you where you are indeed present in our midst, reminding us that we are loved, that we're forgiven, and to be at peace with one another. In your precious name we pray, amen. God dismiss us with your blessing. Fill our hearts with joy and peace. Let us heed your love possessing, triumph in redeeming grace. Oh, refresh us, oh, refresh us, traveling through this wilderness. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his countenance shine upon you and grant you peace. Amen.